This is a special We Went Fast release from David Dewhurst, author of Motocross, The Golden Era, a 480-page coffee table book weighing nearly six pounds and filled with 600 gorgeous images that he captured as a photojournalist during a pivotal era of the sport, 1972 to 1985. It's a monumental achievement and includes so much more than photographs, which is what you're about to listen to. Dewhurst reads to us chapter 14, which is about Bob Hurricane Hanna, once the winningest rider in the sport's history. This book is available at shop.wewentfast.com and it ships for free to customers in the United States. I can't stress enough what a masterpiece this book is and Dewhurst's photographic talent shines within it. Check it out at shop.wewentfast.com. I'm now going to turn this over to Dewhurst, but first an advisory. This is a Bob Hanna story, so there is strong language in his reading. And here is Bob Hanna getting the checkered flag one more time. Bob Hanna was at the lowest point of his motocross career. He shattered his leg into 12 pieces in a water skiing accident and missed the entire 1980 season. Still in pain and far from peak fitness, Hanna, in typical hurricane fashion, didn't sugarcoat the situation. When I came back in 1981, that bike was a pile of shit at Hangtown. It was 35 pounds heavier than Houghton's bike. Not saying Houghton's not a great rider, but put that son of a bitch on a 35 pound heavier bike than me and see who wins. Racing insiders seem to agree. People have been saying that if I'd been around in 1980, Houghton would not have won the title. If people keep saying that to you, it gets under your skin. By the second round of the 1981 championship, Houghton was clearly getting frustrated by all the paddock chatter and wanted to prove a point. Hannah smiles as he remembers that day at Saddleback Park. If he would have left me alone that day in practice, I would never have beat him. He doesn't know that or he's not smart enough to figure that out. I wasn't back yet. If he just left me alone, he'd have won. But in practice, he just had to poke me. He wants to push me around when there's no reason. And he just pissed me off. He poked the fucking tiger. Throughout his career, Hannah had always had the ability to dig deep inside and find the aggressive streak he needed to win. On the day that became known as the massacre at Saddleback, Hannah didn't have to look far for an extra dose of aggression. Howerton, without realizing it, had pushed all the wrong buttons, and the tiger was ready to fight. Probably one of the hardest races I've ever rode, admits Hannah. I was just out of control. Riding beyond his limits, but still managing to stay upright, Hannah banged bars all day with Howerton. It was the ultimate grudge match, and Hannah was determined to win. He said he's an angel in that deal, but that's bullshit, Hannah shouts, still wound up by the memory almost 40 years later. He knew he had a better bike. He knew he was riding better, but he had to poke me. In the first moto, Hannah and Houghton started banging bars. And before long, it turned into an all-out war. Hannah T-boned Houghton, and the Texan returned the favour. Each rider was flipping off the other as the aggressive moves got worse. Houghton finally went down after a hard hurricane move. The Texan got back up and rode harder than ever to win the race. Between motos, the AMA was screaming about dirty riding and banning both the riders. The crowd was screaming about the greatest race they'd ever witnessed. The second race was another bomb-burning example of Hannah's sheer determination. Still riding way above his head, Hannah kept his overweight Yamaha in front of Howard and Suzuki to take the overall win. Hannah's ruthless determination to win has become legend. He's viewed by many to be one of the greatest racers of all time. David Bailey explains it simply. He set the bar for us all to follow. He lifted and carried the whole sport on his back for a while. He taught us how to be tough, 
how to interact with the fans, how to train, how to win. Hannah is now considered a motocross deity, but the kid from Quartz Hill, California never dreamed of being a motocross star. In fact, the skinny young son of an aircraft engineer didn't even know what motocross was when he first started riding. All he knew was the endless expanse of Mojave Desert that stretched from his family's garage door all the way to the horizon. Hannah's first bike was a red and white Honda 55 moped that his dad modified by removing the front fender and leg guards. It was a low ball start to off-road riding, but Hannah didn't let his Mongol Honda slow him down. Out in the sand and pucker bushes, he developed his natural talent chasing his dad, Wild Bill, and his uncle Mel as they blasted their triumphs out across the boiling desert floor. Wild Bill showed his son all the tricks. Hannah smiles as he recalls, I had a good quality to be able to stay on a bike when it's 90% out of shape, but I think I learned that from my father. He'd have kicked my ass if I fell off a bike out in the desert when we were learning how to ride, he said. Hey, knock it off. Don't drop the bike. Don't fall. Don't ride over your head. So I learned when I got out of shape, I don't jump off them. I save them. And I was very good at that. Hannah's wild riding style was burnt in at a very young age as he tried ever harder to keep up with his dad and Uncle Mel. Uncle Mel was great at hill climbing, remembers Hannah. He could climb anything on his bike. Bob tried hard to follow his uncle, but the little Honda wasn't up to the task. He needed something faster. Wild Bill found him a Hodaka 90, and then an even faster Hodaka 100. A real dirt bike meant that Hannah could really ride fast, and was quickly developing a wild riding style that would stay with him throughout his professional career. If he wasn't out pounding the desert on his Hodaka, Hannah was pounding the local bicycle motocross tracks. He used the same wild riding style on the BMX track, and he soon started to win races. I like winning, says Hannah. It became a passion that would go on to drive him to amazing heights. Victory became an obsession. A friend of Wild Bill's recognized Hannah's determination to win and offered to lend the 18-year-old his 250cc to race in 1974. The pair loaded up the truck and drove over the hills to Indian Dunes, a hotbed of racing talent just north of Los Angeles. Despite years of riding in the desert, Hannah had never seen a motocross track before and had no real clue what to expect. He entered the intermediate class. With a broad grin, Hannah says, I remember they said, hit the berm over there. I said, what's a berm? I had no idea but the kid with no idea managed to win his first race and was instantly moved up to the expert class. Southern California expert class was full of extremely fast riders by the mid-1970s. It was a training ground for almost all the future factory races, with tracks like Indian Dunes, Saddleback Park, Escape Country and Carlsbad. There were races most days or nights of the week for the fast guys to hone their skills. Hannah started watching the other guys because I didn't know what I was doing. I'd see somebody doing something and think, I've got to try that. He was a fast learner and finished fourth in his first expert race. Hannah soon realized that he could take home prize money and make a living if he could win races. He decided to leave the family home, loaded up the truck, and moved 100 miles south to Orange County, where he shared a house with a group of young guys. He found a job welding expansion chambers at a local shop and started saving his money. Hannah raced every chance he got, but up against some of the fastest racers in the country, he quickly realized that his CZ just wasn't fast enough. So only a few months after his debut race at Indian Dunes, Hannah walked into the Husqvarna dealer in Whittier, California, and counted out his life savings for a 250 Husky. Armed with a more competitive bike, he started banging handlebars with big local names like John DeSoto and Rex Staten. Hannah dove into the deep end of the motocross pool, and he quickly learned that to stay afloat he had to be aggressive. In less than a year, Hannah had risen from a rookie at Indian Dunes to winning expert races against the best. He had the speed, but lacked consistency. Prize money from his victories was barely covering husky spare parts. Hannah then started race testing for Suzuki's RM development department. 
he was paid for testing. He was riding hundreds of laps a week and learning more about bike development than most factory racers. His race bike costs were covered, and he raced two classes a week, and he beat anyone who showed up to race him at the weekly CMC club races at Saddleback and Carlsbad. Five years of most pro racers' careers were crammed into six months. But Suzuki wouldn't send him to the Nationals. Then, one day, Gary Harlow of DG Performance approached Hannah and offered some serious support. There wasn't much money involved, but DG would provide a van and a mechanic to get Hannah to some big races. Most of those races were in and around Los Angeles, but the Team DG van did head out to a couple of national races to see how the kid from Palmdale would do against the country's best. At the New Orleans round, Hannah, who'd grown up in the dry heat of the desert and was showing blazing speed against the fastest 125s in the country, experienced his first high-humidity race in boiling temperatures. He didn't drink enough water and ended up collapsing and being carried off to the ambulance. It was a humbling and humiliating moment for Hannah, and he remembers riders laughing at him as he lay recovering. But it turned out to be one of the most important moments in his career. It honed his desire, and Team Yamaha management took notice of his speed and offered him a factory ride for 1976. Hannah vowed that he'd never let anything like New Orleans happen to him again. He was going to start training as hard as he could, determined to be the fittest rider on the track. He became obsessed with running and riding bicycles and lifting weights and riding his practice bike. Strength and stamina became his mantra, and it would be the secret of his success for more than 15 years of professional racing. Looking back on his early national career, Hanra admits he wasn't the fastest rider. I never won a race from the gate in 1977 because I wasn't as fast as those guys, he says. If you put me in a 250 national with my 1977 qualifying times, I'm 10th. I'm 10th. Wynert, Tony, Marty, Pomeroy, you name them, they're all ahead of me. Hannah knew the secret to success was fitness. I figured out that they were going to be tired out at 30 minutes. If I'm going faster at 30 minutes than I was at the start, then I could win. I wasn't tired, and they were. Hannah admits the fitness became an obsession that sometimes cost him dearly. I broke a wrist while training, and that cost me millions. In 1983, I just wanted to lap them. Someone should have told me to bag it. I was doing too much. Hannah was riding six days a week. Yamaha mechanic Keith McCarty remembers Hannah wanting to practice on his race bike the morning of the race. He didn't care that the bike might be dirty for tech inspection. He just wanted to ride. Hannah breaks out into a big grin as he remembers a race where he lined up alongside Gail and Mosher. Mosher tells his mechanic one day, sitting right next to me, Monday morning, I'm going to start training. We're going to win some of these. I go, what the F have you been doing for six months? I'm winning today because I was training in October, Mac. I didn't train last week to win today. I trained three months ago to win today. Today, the dumbass is thinking on the start line. He realizes we all want to win, and he's thinking, I'm going to start training. If nobody had been allowed to train and just relied on raw talent, Hannah admits Marty Tribes would have won every race and probably Wynett would have got second. And if we'd all had to be drunk on Saturday night, Wynett would have won every week. Hannah believes his success came down to total commitment and no outside influences distracting him. I didn't have weekends for 20 years of my life. I never had a life. He saw the same commitment in Suzuki's Mark Barnett. Fantastic rider. He had nothing pulling at him. He'd go hide with grandma in Alabama and just burn gas. I wanted to strangle his grandma because she cooked for him. He'd train all day long, sleep all night. I said, we have to put out a hit on his grandmother because he's killing us because he had nothing tugging at him. Looking back, Hannah says, the only fun is whipping their ass on the weekend. That's the only fun you're going to get out of it. It's work. Confronted about the notion that he only raced for money, Hannah jumps forward in his chair, his racist blood clearly boiling. Not a chance in hell. 
Yeah, I negotiated my contracts as good as I could, but money was never what motivated me. After the negotiations were over, I didn't talk money. I didn't think money. I didn't win motorcycle races for money. It was just about kicking their ass and telling Yamaha their bike was a piece of shit. Hannah admits that in the early days at Yamaha, the bikes were good. The 1976-125 was a good bike. It wasn't the greatest, but it was a good bike. You know, that water cooling was a good idea, and putting it on the handlebars was not a good idea. But it still worked good. In 1977, I believe the production bike was better than the works bikes, because I rode a production bike in the Supercross, because it worked. The year 1977 will probably be better known as the year that mechanic Keith McCarty held out the infamous pit board telling Hannah to let Brock buy. It was a terrible low point for a racer who puts winning over everything else. I'm loyal to the company, but that was a stupid way of doing it. They never said anything before the race because they didn't think I could beat Brock that day. Bad mistake. Hannah admits that after letting Clover win the race and ultimately the championship, he rode off into the woods after he crossed the finish line and shed a tear. He was pissed off. I didn't like those games. It went against everything the racer in him believed in. He had to win at all costs, so there was just no reason to race. Sheer determination took Hannah and his Yamaha to three national titles, three Supercross titles and a Trans AMA championship by the end of the 1979 season. The champ was at the top of his form when disaster struck. During a rare off-season play weekend, Hannah and friend Marty Tripes were water skiing on the Colorado River. Tripes was driving the boat and Hannah admits to not paying enough attention. He never saw the partially submerged log that shattered his leg into 12 pieces and put him out of action for over a year. Doctors first told Hannah he'd never race again. They didn't know Hannah. Displaying the same obsession that had taken him to so many titles, the hurricane made a complete recovery that few imagined possible. By the fourth round of the 1981 Supercross season, Hannah had battled back to victory and had won the second round of the 250 Outdoor Series to let everyone know that the hurricane was back. Despite these great victories, things were not happy in the Yamaha camp. When he returned after his broken leg healed, Hannah felt the bike development had gone nowhere. I didn't need a good bike that year. I needed a great bike. I didn't need a pile of crap. Even worse, Yamaha officials in Japan were blaming a lack of good results on the riders. How do you tell a desk jockey back in Japan that his bike's a piece of junk? Hannah gets visibly angry more than 40 years later. Yamaha put me on the 125 for 1982. I don't know what the other guys were doing on the team, but they weren't working on the damn bike. And when I came back after racing all of 1981 on the inferior 250, for 1982, the 125 was a pile of shit at Hangtown. Hannah soldiered on with the Yamaha with only two podiums all season, and something had to change. He needed to win races, and there was only one team with bikes almost guaranteed to win. Honda had introduced their 250RC factory bikes and made everything else almost obsolete. Hannah wanted that bike, and he didn't care what it cost him. I took a $200,000 pay cut to ride that Honda, Hannah shouts out proudly. I just wanted to show the guys at Yamaha that their bike was a piece of crap. Honda team manager Dave Arnold, who'd formerly been mechanic for Hannah's nemesis Marty Smith, understood Hannah well. Bob used to have a punching bag in the back of his truck. He'd put other riders' pictures on the bag and punch the hell out of it. The Honda team needed some of that attitude. We needed some piss and vinegar. Hannah proved to be a great addition to the team and gave an edge to Bailey and O'Mara. Arnold remembers. He got the nickname Brittle Bob because of his nagging injuries, but he was a great team guy and really helped us. On any given day, he could be the fastest. The speed was enough to give Hannah some memorable victories, but he would not win another national title. He came close in the 1983 National Series on the Honda, but a broken wrist cut those hopes short. 
Anna soldiered on for a few more years, but a broken pelvis and another broken wrist took their toll. I burned myself out at Honda. I was trying too hard. Somebody should have told me to back off. Hannah's obsession with training and winning had gone too far. His body was starting to pay the price. But Hannah had one last big race left in his soul. In probably his greatest effort, or that of any motocrosser, he proved once and for all to be the most intense racer in motocross history. For the 1987 Motocross to Nations at Unadilla, a partially retired Hannah was chosen to join full-time racers and past Motocross to Nations champions Jeff Ward and Ricky Johnson. They won in one of the grittiest and most inspiring team performances in the nation's history. For the fans of Unadilla, Hannah was the decade-long favourite rider. Even though he was long past his prime and hadn't won a 125 race in 10 years, they cheered and willed him to victory in the 125 class. The team shared their glory with an invitation to the White House and congratulations from President Ronald Reagan. Looking back on his 15-year career, Hannah feels lucky to have walked away in one piece. I've crashed my brains out so many times and I'm still walking. Anybody that walks out, don't feel sorry for yourself. You made a million, you made a hundred thousand, you made ten million. Shut the hell up, is my opinion. Despite breaking most of the bones in his body, some of them twice, Hannah looks back at the dangers and feels lucky. Was he ever scared? Every time I buckled into a rental car, I was scared. The racing didn't scare him, but rental cars did. I remember at a Florida series one year, five cars came out there and four of them didn't go home. We were racing and seeing who could go across the lake, get up to 80 miles an hour and see who had the balls to go out further and hydroplane. And each guy would go, oh, I'll go a little further. You know, it was bad. Despite all the dangers, Hannah stepped away from the sport in 1989 and never looked back. With three national titles and three Supercross championships and a Trans AMA title, the kid from the Mojave Desert had nothing left to prove. At this point in his life, winning doesn't seem too important anymore. If you got six championships or five or eight, does it really matter? Don't be fooled when you hear Hannah downplay winning. Fifteen years of racing might have rounded off some of the rough edges that he had in the early days at Indian Dunes, but Hannah is still Hannah. Competitive as ever, winning these days means selling more planes or doing great land deals in Idaho. He doesn't need to put his body on the line like he used to, but he still likes to tell things as he sees them. His brutal honesty rubs a lot of people the wrong way, just like he did in 1975. But Hannah doesn't care. He's just going to tell you what he thinks anyway. You've got to have the ego. You've got to have a want, and you've got to have a big fucking heart. He might not have humility, but nobody can ever argue that Bob Hanna doesn't have heart. Thanks for listening to the Bob Hanna chapter of Motocross, the Golden Era. If you want to see images of the book and get a peek at its contents, go to shop.wewentfast.com. Until Mr. Dewhurst releases the next chapter, thank you.